Hello, I'm Maria Williams with the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. Che enjoys bringing you the latest environmental health science through our partnership calls and webinars, news feeds, publications, and social media. I would like to welcome everyone to today's CHE Partnership Webinar, which is titled The Scientific Integrity Act, Preserving Research and Open Communication for the Common Good. Our moderator today is Steve Heilig, Director of Public Health and Education at the San Francisco Marin Medical Society and at CHE. We will leave time following the presentations for a brief Q&A session. You may type in questions through the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window at any point during the presentation. After the presentation, our moderator will read questions out for our panelists to respond to. We will get to as many comments and questions as we can during the Q&A period. For those of you who called in on the phone, we have posted slides to accompany today's webinar on our website. You can download these by going to healthandenvironment.org. Please scroll to the bottom of the page and select today's webinar. On the webinar page is a link to the slides. Everyone on the webinar right now is muted with the exception of our moderator and our speakers. This webinar is scheduled to last for 45 minutes and is being recorded for our call and webinar archive. With that, I'll turn things over to you, Steve. Thank you very much, Maria, and good day to everybody. I'm very pleased that we're having this particular call today, the theme being uh, science and the integrity thereof. It really cuts to the one of the primary impetus when we began CHE over 15 years ago now uh, to try to make sure that both research and policy in general is informed by the best environmental health, uh, in our case, science that's available. I really enjoy the uh, definition of science as put out by Webster's Dictionary. The shortest first definition is simply the state of knowing or knowledge as distinguished from ignorance or misunderstanding, which would seem to make a lot of sense as a good thing to inform our policy. Now today's call, we have two speakers. Uh, the Congressman Tonko has been called to a vote and will hopefully be able to join us later. So we are going to go first with Dr. Rosenberg who uh, is director of the Center for Science and Democracy at the Union of Concerned Scientists, which by the way is a group I am proud to have been a member of for many years now. Uh, with more than 25 years experience in government service and academic nonprofit leadership, he also has a doctorate in biology and uh, will talk to us about some of the issues that lead to the kind of uh, proposed legislation that the congressman will be talking about. So. Uh, Dr. Andrew Rosenberg, please go ahead and again uh, remind everybody that we have slides to follow along here. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Steve, and it's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. As Steve said, my name is Andrew Rosenberg. Uh, I am a uh, biologist. I'm a marine scientist. I've worked on the science of uh, uh, natural resources, environmental policy, environmental regulation, in science and policy interface for some time. I've worked in government um, as a senior official in the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, I have been in the university sector as Dean of Life Sciences and Agriculture at the University of New Hampshire, and now at the Union of Concerned Scientists leading a Center for Science and Democracy. Next slide, please, Maria. Um, Hopefully the slides will advance momentarily. Um, well, the center, while we're waiting for the slide, next slide, uh, the Center for Science and Democracy, the program I now lead, seeks to strengthen the role and integrity of science in public policy. Um, we try to push back against mis misinformation. We work to neutralize attacks on the science process. That is the process by which science connects into public policy, um, the science that is um, available to the public for uh, members of the public to form their own opinions. Um, and we encourage scientists to speak out and be deeply involved in democratic process as well as uh, the, the uh, public policy process. And we defend scientists when they do speak out. There we go. Um, 
And uh, we work, we believe that the democratic process, the, our democracy overall is strengthened by better and fairer access to science. That is not implying that science is the only source of knowledge or the only input to societal choices and democratic decision making, but it is an important input. And we want scientists to be more engaged in public policy and uh, by extension then give greater access to science for citizens. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, well, right now we're in a very challenging time uh, for uh, science and public policy in the United States. I'm sure everyone on the webinar recognizes that. Um, uh, from all perspectives, uh, we are in a very challenging time. Um, is it possible to advance the slide? Um, this is not, however, the first time that science has been either misrepresented or has been, if you like, under siege in the federal government. Um, the program that I lead now, its forerunner, was the um, Scientific Integrity Program at the Union of Concerned Scientists started uh, it, during the Bush administration. Um, during the Bush administration, the George W. Bush administration, um, we observed what I'll call a pattern uh, of abuse of science, uh, where political interference um, uh, in uh, the scientific information, the process, the science that was used in public policy became too much the norm and we felt important need to push back. Now again, the Bush administration wasn't the, weren't the first to um, uh, manipulate scientific evidence for political purposes, but it became quite blatant um, or to an unprecedented degree during the George W. Bush administration and we began the scientific integrity program with a call to action um, for scientific freedom, the ability of scientists to speak out and not have their information manipulated. <laughs> Sorry about that, there's a fire station across the street. Um, and uh, we pushed back by reporting on um, the need to secure scientific integrity um, across the government and in information presented to the public. If I can go to the next slide, please. Um, well, when President Obama came into office, he, uh, for scientists, uh, made a, uh, uh, used a famous phrase that we should restore science to its rightful place in our democratic process and in public policy in 2009. Um, and in fact, we made very significant progress over the eight years of the Obama administration with regard to the role that science plays in our public policy and the ability to push back against political manipulation of science. Not without problems. It certainly was the case that there were difficulties uh, during the uh, Obama administration because there'll always be that tendency to want to focus in on the information that's most convenient to a policy position that you want to take. And again, we don't believe that science is the only input to decision making, but it always should be an important one. If you're going to make a decision, better that you make it on the actual scientific evidence as opposed to some manipulation of that scientific evidence. So despite problems during the Obama administration, we and many other coalition partners <coughs> were successful at instituting um, scientific integrity policies in 28 federal agencies across the government. They vary in strength, they vary in the ability uh, of those agents or the, the um, motivation of those agencies to actually um, hold themselves to that high standard of scientific integrity, but they include important aspects of ensuring that there isn't political manipulation of scientific evidence, that scientists have a right of last review that scientists may speak out and speak to the press and may be on social media to talk about their science, not to say anything they want about agency positions, but to talk about their scientific work and that <coughs> they have the right to publish and so forth um, coming out of the, the federal system, which is a very crucial part um, of the science enterprise of the United States and many other countries in collaboration uh, with university scientists and private sector scientists and so on. So it was critically important to have those policies established in the many agencies that are, we view, science-based. If I can go to the next slide, please. 
Well, we had an election, as some of you might have noticed. <coughs> and if we go to just prior to the election, um, in surveying scientists, we knew that there were some existing problems. Um, we knew that um, leadership in agencies can prioritize politics over science, or they can prioritize science over politics. And that filters down into the um, agencies. That's the way that federal agencies tend to work. Um, you know, if the director at CDC, as in this quote from 2015, is less concerned about insulating science from politics than the rest of the staff are. And some scientists in the Department of Interior and the Fish and Wildlife Service felt that um, the Fish and Wildlife Service has been, in this person's word, captured by industries it's meant to regulate. Next slide, please. Well, in the Trump administration, all of those kinds of issues and many more have really come um, come home to roost. Uh, again, you know, it's not as if the Obama administration was, um, you know, perfect or fully implemented all of the standards for scientific integrity, but under the Trump administration, we're really facing a new set of threats. Next slide, please. Um, we have seen advisory committees um, manipulated recently. The advisory committee at the EPA, um, you know, it's a normal course of affairs that uh, on a science advisory committee, people serve two terms and then rotate off. I've served on science com advisory committees for other agencies like the Navy and for NOAA and so forth. Um, uh, at the EPA and the Trump administration, um, they decided not to renew existing science advisors for um, a second term. Uh, to be appointed to a key uh, so-called the Board of Scientific Counselors. Um, and the stated reason was we need to have more industry-based scientists um, sitting on advisory committees for agencies. Um, if I can keep going um, to the next slide. Um, you know, we have seen uh, again at the EPA um, an overruling of the scientific information on pesticide use. So chlorpyrifos um, was, uh, there was a clear risk assessment report on the risks of chlorpyrifos for um, child brain development. Um, the, the decision to put strict limits on its use was overturned uh, by Administrator Pruitt uh, as his, really as his first act um, as an administrator, pretty much um, at the behest of Dow Chemical, the, the producers of that chemical. Um, we've seen um, uh, already uh, um, the administration or uh, administrator of the EPA declare that he wants to again review the ozone, stand, ozone standards, even though there's been clear scientific evidence um, on the effects of ozone on public health. And so um, there's going to be a delay then in, in requiring uh, local um, municipalities and states to implement uh, stricter ozone standards, something that Mr. Pruitt fought against before he uh, was with the federal government. Next slide, please. Um, we also have a concern about what I'd call uh, self-censorship within agencies. Um, many agencies uh, even though they don't fully, they're not fully staffed with political appointments, um, uh, are still uh, trying to decide, uh, you know, what is required and what the new administration wants them to do in their jobs. And so there's been, you know, the sort of silly arguments of don't use the words climate change um, within the agencies, whether that's not necessarily a clear written mandate from the administration. Uh, but does seem to be uh, coming forward in many uh, discussions and at least verbally communicated. We shouldn't be talking about climate change. There's been canceling participation in scientific meetings by agency scientists, um, delays in scientific meetings, and a change in the way that agencies interact with stakeholders. Uh, next slide, please. So um, very early on after the election, we... Um, Union of Concerned Scientists developed a letter um, from now over 5,000 scientists um, declaring that we uh, believe that it's critically important that the president 
uh, respect the role of science and his administration, respect the role of science, um, respect the role that science plays in serving the public interest. And I'd have to say, even though that um, letter was led by 23 Nobel laureates, and is now I think up to probably closer to 6,000 scientists, um, there's been no response from this administration. Um, next slide, please. Well, um, because, exactly because we have these kinds of concerns um, uh, with the new administration uh, on protecting federal science and scientists, uh, we believe it's critically important uh, that uh, not only do external groups declare the importance of um, uh, scientific evidence in the democratic process, but that Congress take a role. And so um, Congressman Tongo and, uh, Tonko and others um, uh, have stepped up to the plate um, to introduce a bill on scientific integrity. Again, the Scientific Integrity Act is to address many of the concerns of politicization of science that we see emerging um, in the Trump administration. And frankly, as I said before, um, there is always some tendency to do this across all administrations who want to push forward their agenda. It's more severe than we've ever seen before, but it's critically important that we have a clear standard that we want agencies and the public to have access to the scientific evidence, not somebody's political, uh, politically manipulated spin of the scientific evidence. Uh, my understanding now is that the Bill has 125 co-sponsors, and again, I think it's wonderful that um, Congressman Tonko has uh, taken a leadership role uh, with so many of his colleagues, uh, but we want to continue uh, to build support for the idea that um, scientific integrity is a key part of the policymaking process. We want to emphasize agency um, scientific integrity policies. We want to require um, agencies as a matter of law to develop procedures that allow scientists to review and ensure the accuracy of public facing materials. And we want to ensure that in fact, these kinds of standards on scientific integrity are enforceable, um, not simply by administrative or agency policy, um, by, but by uh, statute um, as only Congress can do. So um, having congressional support for those basic protections for scientists across agencies is critical. It's not just to protect the scientists, but to protect the science that they provide in the public interest. Next slide, please. Um, there is a huge amount, if I can go to the next slide, please. Um, there is a huge amount of energy in the science community. We've seen a march for science and sometimes scientists are a little clumsy at expressing their uh, points of view. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's critically important that scientists have come out into the streets, into the public square to speak out. Uh, you know, we are no longer in an age when uh, scientists can retreat to their labs and hope everything will be okay. Um, the threats we're facing are too important. And so on the March for Science uh, in April, uh, around the world, over a million scientists demonstrated in the People's Climate March. Then a week later, you know, hundreds of thousands of people here in DC um, were out in the streets. And that mobilization, I think, is a, um, not only a symbol of the concern that people have, but is an entry point for scientists to be more active with, not on their own, but in um, partnership with all who care about um, science and the public interest, public health issues, and the things that CAG cares so deeply about, as we all do. Next slide, please. We at UCS have um, organized what we call watchdog teams um, uh, to around the country, scientists who are part of our science network to try to help with this effort to um, hold our elected officials accountable um, that means that uh, those watchdog teams are groups of scientists in key states uh, that can speak as constituents to their elected officials 
Um, they're knowledgeable constituents on science issues, just as many of you are, are deeply knowledgeable in your fields and your constituency matters um, in addition to your expertise. And we want scientists to speak out as constituents. Again, sorry, the fire station is speaking out. Um, we provide fact sheets, we um, provide training, uh, we give guidance for how to meet with elected officials, how to host public education events, how to get in local media, social media, as well as local print media um, at a community level to try to build um, political momentum um, to call out abuses of, of scientific information, to call out um, manipulation of the uh, process by which public health and safety protections are created. And I can go on for quite a long time about some of the, uh, and what we would view as a tax on science and uh, the Trump administration, including manipulation of the regulatory process, um, which would undermine the way that science informs public policy. So we want scientists all around the country to speak out and particularly to their elected officials. That's the only mechanism we have for holding um, officials accountable is hold them accountable in the court of public opinion. Next slide, please. Um, so I would thank you. I'm not sure if the Congressman is back and if not, perhaps uh, Steve, we can take a few questions, uh, but uh, would urge you to, um, you know, go to the union of concerned scientists website, uh, look at our information on the tax on science, as well as on scientific integrity. We reported in January um, on um, so progress on scientific integrity in the last uh, two administrations uh, with guidance on what we hoped this new administration would do. Again, while we've had no response, that guidance is important. We're not just saying no to everything that is coming forward. We've actually put forward um, proposals for how things should work. And I think the scientific integrity bill from led by uh, Congressman Tonko is, is um, a critical step if we can take this action to ensure that scientific evidence informs our public health and safety protections and our public policy more broadly. Steve, I will stop there and, and see where we are in the process. Um, well, thank you very much. I, I think we can talk a little bit here and see if we do have any questions. I'm wondering, a couple of my own here, um, the, the work that you're doing and the uh, scope of the proposed legislation is quite broad in terms of a sweeping uh, concern, uh, even an indictment of where the pressure is coming on various fronts. If you were forced to prioritize a few, a handful of issues in particular, or fields sure. that you think really need to be uh, addressed, pushed back on, however you might address it, what might those be, a top three or five, something like that? Well, I certainly do think establishing the principle of scientific integrity is in law um, is a high priority. Um, and while the bill doesn't, isn't prescriptive for every agency on exactly all the details of a scientific integrity policy, it gives overall set of principles that can be tailored for use by um, each agency, but does mandate uh, some action. And um, as I said, we have scientific integrity policies in place in 28 agencies uh, they are somewhat um, uh, uneven across those agencies. And this would give the ability to ensure that, in fact, there was a statutory requirement. A second area that I think is very high priority is that there are, uh, unfortunately, a set of attempts um, in Congress to change the the process by which public health and safety protections are created. Uh, that is the regulatory process under the Administrative Procedures Act um, and, uh, and uh, through the enabling statutes for everything from clean air to clean water to consumer protection, um, uh, worker safety and so on. If that process is changed such that it gives industry an even stronger hand um, in um, in, in crafting or pushing back against regulations, um, then that would mean that 
I believe we would have very serious negative public health consequences and safety consequences as well as environmental consequences for the country. And those efforts are somewhat obscure, things like the Regulatory Accountability Act, which would um, change the way that science connects into, into um, public policy decision making and give industry many more opportunities to challenge um, the science advice, present alternative advice, string out the regulatory process. It adds over 100 new steps um, to actually putting a regulation in place. There are other bills, including the so-called Honest Act, which would restrict the information that agencies could actually use, scientific information that they could use in crafting regulations, manipulate acts that would manipulate the science advisory boards to declare that academic scientists had a conflict of interest, effectively declare academic scientists had conflicts of interest, but you know, industry-based scientists shouldn't be excluded from uh, serving as advisors because of their conflicts of interest, and crazy stuff like that. I think pushing back on those congressional attacks is also a high priority. And then finally, on the administrative attacks, again, there is an effort to completely halt the regulatory process, um, as well as roll back existing public health and safety protections, either by delaying implementation or by such things as the executive order that requires um, that for any new regulation, two regulations that impose at least as much cost on um, industry be removed. Well, that standard is, is a good political talking point, but what it effectively means is that agencies are unable to move forward with any new uh, public health protections, regardless of the threat that they are trying to address. And it's extremely high priority to shine some light on those and to push back um, so that we don't start having this regulatory rollback that the president likes to talk about. But if you think about it directly, really means we're going to reduce the number of protections for public health and safety from where we are now, not make progress on better protection. So there's three big areas that um, need attention. Thank you. And um, historically, I think as you, you, you alluded to this, uh, getting science-based professionals, scientists, physicians, et cetera, has always, to be uh, politically active, to be advocates, has always been an uphill battle. Um, this is why UCS exists and why a group like Physicians for Social Responsibility exists. Um, do you pro I mean how do you select I mean some of it's self selecting people who want to be involved and join your groups and and then some of it is out outreach and do you uh train people do you provide uh, uh you know training for them and how to do this guidelines and so forth to act, get active on these complex issues yeah i mean the the short answer is yes we do provide training uh, not only communications training but engagement training like i described for our watchdog teams and we have toolkits for you know, how can you act as a scientist constituent at a local level? You know, there's many other organizations that do communications training and some others that are doing more of engagement in the public policy process. Um, additionally, I'd say while that debate about whether scientists should be engaged in policy has gone on for a long time, I think we made a step change uh, with this new administration and with the March for Science and other actions that we have moved beyond the point where uh, many, many scientists uh, felt that they could not actually take uh, positions on public policy because it would somehow compromise them. I personally think that that's a very much an outdated view. It might have been appropriate when I did my doctoral training, you know, in the 1980s, but is not appropriate now. And frankly, I'm not sure it was even appropriate then. I mean, I work in an advocacy organization. Uh, a couple of months ago, I published a research paper in my own field in, in uh, fisheries uh, management, or actually fisheries uh, um, population dynamics. Doesn't really matter what the field is. You know, that paper went into peer review, was um, uh, published in an a, a high quality academic journal. Um, you know, was, I hope, <laughs> Uh, very strong research and uh, had many collaborators who work in all kinds of different institutions. The fact that I work in an advocacy organization had no impact on whether I could do good science or not. That was strictly a matter of whether I did good science or not. 
as judged by my peers. And I think particularly younger scientists have moved beyond the discussion about whether you somehow compromise your scientific um, credibility by stepping out and speaking out on issues. So we provide training and we're seeing a greater and greater call for it. And I think other organizations are seeing the same thing. Now, obviously, you are you, you talked a bit about the bill itself. Um, I, I don't know if the congressman will be here soon, but from your point of view, it's um, it's fascinating to read. It's actually by legislative standards or model of brevity, um, but it does contain a lot of very uh, strong statements, really, it seemed to me. And I'm wondering if you might uh, want to summarize from your perspective what you see in it that's most valuable. Well, I think what's most important, and the reason why it, it is um, a model of brevity, as you pointed out, is because it sets some key principles, but it doesn't try to be exhaustive. So I don't, you know, different agencies do different things, as I'm sure the Congressman will describe in terms of his thinking about the putting forward the bill. Um, so for example, there is a scientific integrity policy that was only completed in January in the Department of Energy, um, which is one of the biggest science agencies in the country. Um, that scientific integrity policy had to consider what do you do with the national laboratories, which are not you know, which are run by the Department of Energy, but have many, many contract science staff and have a different relationship um, than strict federal employees who are scientists might in my old agency in NOAA working in a, you know, a laboratory in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, where I used to work. Um, and so agencies need some flexibility in how to address many concerns, but the scientific integrity bill says you need to ensure that scientists are fully part of the process to make sure that the scientific information comes clearly. You need to make these standards enforceable. You need to give capability of scientists to speak out. Um, that needs to be codified so that um, agencies at least have a common set of standards to work to upon which they can elaborate. <coughs> they can't compromise on those standards, but they can elaborate. Um, and again, the goal here is a fairly simple one in, in principle. That is that scientific evidence um, as developed by scientists come through, comes through um, into a public sphere so that people can know what um, scientists working in federal agencies with many, many partners in um, university and private sector uh, are saying and have better access to that information. Now, I just say one other thing about scientific evidence. This is not, you know, um, there's, there is a tendency sometimes, particularly in media and sometimes in political talking points, to pick on the one study that happens to demonstrate your position. But scientific evidence is really about the weight of evidence. So it's important that not just one study be pushed forward, but that the body of work around key issues, such as public health and safety protections, uh, become more broadly available and known. Not because the studies are conflicting, but because you want to be able to say, well, there's some things we know pretty well, and there's some things that still <coughs> remain to be determined. And so I think the bill does a good job of capturing the essence without trying to be overly prescriptive. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not sure if you'd care, we, we were told that the Congressman is on his way now, so, but I'm not sure if you care to speculate on where a lot of this, uh, really what people have called an assault on science is, is coming from. I mean, there's a lot of commentary that we now have an unprecedented mix of profit-oriented motives, corporate interests, and so forth involved uh, in the political process. It's always been true. It seems to be heightened now. Um, there are some that have been uh, very blatant uh, with respect to appointments from industry, et cetera. Um, the cynic says that this is all about money and profit. Um, do you think that's true, or is there a particular ideology that's just as uh, important that's going on here? I do think there's an ideological basis to some of this. I certainly think that um, some 
I, I would say some industry sectors, not individual companies so much, but trade organizations and uh, industry organizations, as well as some more ideologically based organizations, heritage, and, you know, CEI and others, um, along with the Chamber of Commerce and the American Petroleum Institute and the American Chemistry Council. They have very um, deliberately created a narrative that says that regulations are bad. Regulations are only there to impose costs on businesses and therefore kill jobs. You'll notice in that narrative, they never talk about public benefits. And this administration, both the president and his appointees have adopted that narrative of regulations are terrible things. They shackle the economy, they um, kill jobs, you know, they hinder profit and so on. I think sometimes people tend to buy into their own narratives. Well, in fact, you know, regulations are rules to protect the public interest. They're not, you know, it's not that all regulations are perfect or I used to be a regulator for, for marine resources. It's a very difficult task to do. You always get it somewhat wrong. Um, but there are fundamental public health, safety, and environmental protections um, that are intended through the regulatory process. But having that narrative out there that says regulations are bad, they kill jobs, has been very, uh, it, you know, it, it has captured a large segment of at least the political classes here in Washington um, and has now sort of brought its way into or, or found its way into this administration with comments such as from um, Steve Bannon, the president's counselor, to deconstruct the administrative state. Um, uh, so ideologically, I think people just want to say business should be left alone to do what they want to do. And the only problem with that is how is the public interest protected? Um, you know, regulations are not about, they do impose costs on business. So if a business is, is um, you know, polluting with a toxic, some kind of a toxic substance, should we just say, well, it's up to that business whether they want to or not? I mean, there needs to be a direct pushback for what is in the public's interest. So regulations really are about that public interest. But the narrative is very compelling. It's odd to me. I mean, the logic of it is odd because, of course, the um, you know all these terrible regulations are killing jobs and killing profits. Said, you know, many industry sectors that have made fantastic profits over the last decades and continue to do so. It's not that they're short of money to invest for greater employment. They're investing that money in other ways, like automation and so on. Um, so, you know, no, I mean, I think it's easy to recognize that no one really likes to be regulated. Nobody likes to be told what to do. But there is a compelling public need, public interest. Um, and that's why it's so important to push back. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It seems we do have the congressman on now. So, uh, Maria, is he available here? Congressman Tonko, are you there? He is available. Um, hold on for one moment while I turn on his video. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. There he is. Is that Congressman Tonko? Yes. I believe uh, I'm on now. Yes, you are. We hear you. Thank you very much for joining us. I and can tell you have a... Okay, we got the audio and video going. I've got audio and video. There you are. Okay, great. Wonderful. Look, thank you all for uh, this opportunity to participate. I want to thank Steve Heiling for uh, the kind uh, offer and the introduction, and certainly Maria. Thank you, Maria Williams, for organizing the effort, and uh, let me thank our host, Che, for... Uh, uh, the uh, purposes of this discussion, the collaborative on the health and environment is a powerful group that I believe brings a lot of facts uh, to the table and that enables us to uh, work accordingly. And uh, Dr. Rosenberg and the Union of Concerned Scientists, thank you for fighting for scientific integrity. I understand you developed uh, great um, opportunities here for us to understand the need for something like the Scientific Integrity Act. Um, independent public scientific research I'm 
firmly convinced helps us make um, what are sound and evidence-based public policy that puts the American people first. That is absolutely important. It's the driving force to my authoring this bill and sponsoring it. Um, let me give you an example. Keeping dangerous substances out of our food and water, out of our homes and our workplaces, can happen with sound public policy. And it's al alarming that this administration, President Trump's administration, is working to undermine independent public science. Now, we need this public science in many, many areas. Let me cite a few. Climate change. I'm the environment ranker on the um, subcommittee to report to the Energy and Commerce Committee. Climate change is absolutely, a, it needs to be addressed, especially in this post pulling us out of the Paris Accord uh, arrangement. Dismantling of science advisory boards, a very disturbing fact. Science um, positions that are left vacant on the uh, OSTP and cuts to science in this president's budget presentation to Congress. They're all very disturbing. So to me, science underscores family values. And this place, our budget, the work we do, ought to put emphases on values, our values. And it does not when it denies science. So I think it's very important for us to fight for these values and to make certain that they work toward the public good. And I see the public really energized. I see them in an organic sort of way, responding from ground, the ground up to call upon Washington to do much better than they currently are performing. Thousands of marchers, in fact, in my home district, the city of New York in Albany, gathered together to turn out for the March for Science. People of all ages, high schoolers, medical school students. I was just totally impressed by all of that activity. And they were demanding much better science. Why would we reject science? I've spoken with the groups like Parkinson's, uh, where they gathered together for a walk and run for hope. And they said, by not funding research, we're denying their hope. And I couldn't agree more. There's also, um, you know, so many compelling reasons when it comes to health-related research, science and innovation research. All of this has driven me passionately to uh, provide for uh, in a bill, which we call Scientific Integrity Act, uh, numbered HR 1358. We are pushing this in a very strong way because it requires um, all sorts of action. It's basically simple. It requires the United States through its federal science agencies to adopt or strengthen um, watchdog policies, putting them in, in statute, making certain that we have these watchdogs at the uh, respective agencies where they will serve as science sheriffs, so to say, so to speak, at each agency. Scientists can't be fired for their unbiased findings. That is one of the principles of our bill. Findings can't be doctored to match industry or political whim, priorities with deep pockets, trying to suppress information, misrepresent it, hide it, whatever. When the taxpayers' dollars are invested in these research efforts, that needs to be respected. And we need science to guide us as we go forward as a nation, competing effectively in an innovation economy, responding as stewards of the environment to climate change, making certain that we're providing, again, hope for people who are counting on science to uh, bring them the, the, the candle in the darkness, so to speak. So we can help, obviously, all of us that are science believers and science uh, 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 folks who are from the science community or those who respect that arena. We can share the Scientific Integrity Act, HR 1358, in our professional circles. I am sharing it now with colleagues. I'm impressed with the number of people well over 140, I believe, that we've had join on to the bill. So we're growing the number of sponsors as we go forward. We sh are sharing this with so many scientific associations, and we're posting on social media, and we would ask that you do the same. Everyone has an audience out there in the social media world, and we need to, um, to make certain we move forward. With the bill sponsors, we're at 126. I said 140. We have some that are going to call us back. There are intentions out there, but firmly 126. So I think we're moving forward rather aggressively, and um, we hope that uh, science gets the uh, respect that it 
uh, truly deserves because it is a major insertion into quality of life, into progress, and into um, uh, the source of uh, growth that we need in our economy for jobs. This should not be a partisan issue. In no way should it be a partisan issue. So we need to go forward and deal with facts, not fiction. We need to go forward with an aggressive uh, protection of public sector dollars, taxpayer dollars, hard-earned taxpayer dollars that, <coughs> excuse me, that invest themselves in science research. And we may need to make certain that those dollars are put to good use and that the information that is rendered through this research is shared appropriately, abundantly, effectively, efficiently with the uh, audiences that uh, they intend to serve. Thank you all thank for you your very, interest. Oh, no, thank you very much. Could you say something about the, the current status and next steps uh, with the legislation? Well, what what happened? As we said, we're, we're looking to um, make certain that we get as many sponsors as we can. We're still in the midst of that stage of the approach. We are then reaching out to both Republican and Democratic offices to get them to pay attention to the bill. And then as it's assigned to committee, um, we will then call upon the audiences out there to engage in the lobbying effort. And we have a similar bill, a like bill in the Senate. Uh, I believe it's Senate 338 that um, we have advanced uh, on behalf of this being a bicameral opportunity. So we want it to be bipartisan, bicameral, and we want to let the world know. You know, I get very concerned when I see us stepping backward when it relates to climate change. I get very concerned about um, the efforts to uh, be uh, cutting edge, as sharp a cutting edge as we can be in the innovation economy. That's an international sweepstakes. We see other countries building, investing into research now is not the time to step backward. So I would share this bill, HR 1358, if you would please, within your professional circles, share them with your associations, because um, obviously that's an audience that gets it immediately. We try to plain English our discussion, our reaching out, our, our, our uh, uh, messaging on this effort, but oftentimes it's, uh, it's difficult to get people to first understand the issue itself where research is meritorious, but then also to juxtapose that discussion discussion with what's happening around the world. And we cannot um, afford to go backward or even stand still. But in this case, there are forces in Washington looking to take us backward. I finally would ask if you would please post on social media, make certain that uh, if you can support this effort to let the world know of your support and then to encourage people to uh, enter in the discussion and the support networks. Uh, Dr. Rosenberg, do you, would you have a uh, comment or question for the congressman based upon? Uh, I, he is, well, I would have a comment, ahead. which is um, I, I uh, commend you for your leadership. I think it's really critically important uh, that you have taken this initiative with your colleagues. I, um, so I certainly commend you. Um, I do hope that there is the opportunity for bipartisan um, support for oh, the bill, I, and, and I think that, as you know, um, this should be a bipartisan issue. It should be. It's great to see something positive in the current environment. That's one of the things. Well, Doc, let me thank thank you for your support and for your praising our efforts. But let me tell you, sitting in two very scientific based committees energy and commerce and science, space and technology, and listening to terms and terms and terms of science denial, you have no choice but to take the pen, write a bill and say, no, we're better than that. It's about scientific integrity. We're not gonna waste dollars that are hard earned coming from the federal taxpayers. Uh, the people of this nation, we want results and we put the American people first, which is so very important. But you know, in terms of bipartisan, I have to say that, um, you know, representing areas that were tremendously flooded, people were calling them 100 and 500 year level storms, all of that activity, I witnessed where people of all persuasions, political persuas uh, persuasions lost everything for what they have ever worked, for which they've worked. And basically, you saw people getting impacted. It didn't know 
Mother Nature didn't know for someone's politics. When I go to a Parkinson's rally and talk about research being done at Albany Medical Center and that that research revenue chain is threatened by cutback, cutbacks in research monies, appropriations here in Washington, it doesn't know if that, if that patient, if that Parkinson's uh, individual living with Parkinson's each and every day, walking that walk with her or his family, we don't ask if you're Republican, Democrat, or independent or non-affiliated. No one knows. So it goes on and on. You know, the, the impacts of all this non-science or uh, worse yet, diluting science or, or, or twisting it tremendously, uh, playing with the results is very disheartening. And we need to go forward and uh, do great things. Uh, one of the reasons I got into this business is that my adolescence was touched by the global race on space. And it was science and research that enabled us to be the first nation in the world to stake our, our, our flag on the surface of the moon and say we have achieved after a setback called Sputnik. So I've lived it. I know what it's about. And I am totally committed to getting this bill done. And we're going to do it with the tenderness of facts on our side and with the, uh, the populist understanding that, uh, you know, there are good things out there we can achieve. So please, please reach out to your professionals, uh, your professional circles and social media and certainly your associations, which are plentiful. And uh, I believe there's growing interest from the calls we receive here, from various publications, from organizations, from social media networking that uh, are very interested in the bill. And uh, it's time for stamping out science denial in Washington. That is not leadership. That is uh, voodoo uh, leadership. That is uh, put, burying your head in the sand. And you know what? If we keep that head buried in the sand long enough, climate change will come and wash the sand away. You're expressing, Congressman, a certain amount of optimism that the bill will move forward, that you can get enough support despite you know, the political I realities always, now. Right. I will always put my money on facts and, and truth. Uh, the truth always rises to the top. How long will that take? It's anybody's guess. But the sooner we start and create the armies of support that are armed with truth, not fiction, uh, will get this done. And what Dr. Rosenbaum and other groups are is bringing the, you know, science, scientists are still expressed as having prestige and respect in our country and, and physicians and so forth. But uh, uh, it seems well, like that. You know, and this really is what amazes me. We spend an awful lot of resources, um, uh, dollars, many times taxpayer dollars, developing the, the intellectual capacity of this great country. Why would we not want to utilize that? Why would we not want to tap into that genius, that creative genius that we have coming out of our academies, our universities, our institutions, our organizations? You know, we pride ourselves on this and we should not be taking a step backward and denying, dumbing down. You know, I go to schools, countless schools to present. And I'm always telling grade schoolers and middle schoolers, being an achiever is a cool thing. Don't let anyone ever tell you that. And here you have government, you know, pouncing on achievement, you know, denying uh, success. One of your colleagues, Congressman, uh, said to me once, you know, everyone here on Capitol Hill is very supportive of STEM education, but sometimes it seems like we don't want to listen to the people that we STEM educated. <laughs> and I thought well, that you know, was that's a very right. good point. You know, one hand is saying, one hand is doing one thing, right? investing in STEM, we need the scientists, the engineers, the uh, mathematicians, the technologists, and then we're saying walk away from what the what work they're producing. And to have it manipulated by politics or ideology or by political networks um, is, is regrettable. We need to do better. And if it's deep pockets that are trying to undo this because they don't want to assume a progressive agenda, shame on us. You know, I think our nation's image was scarred deeply when we pulled out of the Paris Accord. I, I just, I, I, I am troubled Absolutely. by the fact that we're no longer at that table officially, but I'm more troubled by the fact that there's this deep scar on our image. When people come in here from the uh, European Union, they will ask, we've had as many as 14 representatives in the office at the same time. Their first question, where is the giant? And I said, well, while everyone around the world is ratifying that Paris Agreement, we're still 
you know, debating whether or not there's such a concept uh, as human inspired um, global warming. Uh, it's, it's foolishness to the highest order. So, you know, I've had it, I've had it with this talking committee. I'm convinced the overwhelming gr uh, number of us as a great majority of Americans and officials are understanding that, yes, it's about science. It's about letting science speak to us, uh, let research develop for us uh, the terms of where we move and how we move forward. And, um, you know, that provides the integrity for the, uh, the work done here in Washington. And to deny that is just not being a leader. Congressman Tonko, thank you very much for joining us today, and thank you even more for your work it's been on my this honor and my pleasure. crucial issue. And Dr. Rosenberg, you too, do you have something you want to add before we sign off here? Uh, just thank you, and, and thanks to all the uh, participants on the call and to um, CHE for uh, organizing the call and for your continued engagement in this process. Thank you. Thank you, both. Thank you, you everybody. It's been, it, yeah, it's been an you. honor to yeah. join you. Okay, Maria, do you want to wind us up here? Yes, so thank you so much, everyone. We are approaching the end of today's webinar. A video recording of this webinar will be available on the CHE website soon, and a link to it will be included in an email you will receive tomorrow. CHE's next webinar will take place Wednesday, June 21st, and is titled Toxic Cocktail, How Chemical Pollution is Poisoning Our Brains. You can RSVP through CHE's website, healthandenvironment.org. If you are new to CHE and would like to learn more about becoming a CHE partner, please visit the Join Now page of the CHE website. Additionally, if you appreciate these free CHE partnership webinars, we encourage you to support CHE's ongoing work by making a tax-deductible donation via our secure website. With that, I would like to thank our speakers once more for taking the time to present today and Steve for his excellent moderation. Thank you everyone for joining us and have a great day.